everyone. I'm Karen. As Audrey said, I'm uh, Executive Director of Software Freedom Conservancy, and I'll talk a little bit later about what that is. Um, I am a lawyer, but uh, I only do pro bono legal work at this point. Uh, sometimes when I'm in a lawyer, I have to hide for the rotten things thrown at me, but I'm not that kind of lawyer. <laughs> um, I'm really into free and open source software and have been an enthusiast for a really long time. Uh, but what galvanized all of these issues for me is that I'm also a patient. So I literally have a big heart. My heart is three times the size of a normal person's heart, three times the thickness of an ordinary person's heart. It's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and it's fine. I have no symptoms currently. I probably will later. But I am at a very high risk of sudden death, which is actually the medical term is sudden death, <laughs> which uh, is hilarious. Um, <laughs> I'm at a 2 to 3 percent chance per year of suddenly dying compounding, and I was diagnosed at age 31. So um, when I was talking to my um, cardiologist and electrophysiologist about it, they said, well, it's no problem. You know, you're at a very high risk of sudden death, but it's no problem because we now have technology to deal with that. You can get a defibrillator, which will shock you if you go into sudden death. And what they do at the electrophysiologist's office is they have like they keep these defibrillators, they're very expensive equipment. It's like, uh, I got the bill on mine, I mean, not uh, my insurance paid for it, but it's, it was like, I think it was like $90,000. They're extremely expensive, but the device manufacturers give them to doctors so that they have them for patients so that patients aren't afraid. You know, he slips this across the desk to me and I hold it up and it's small and it's light and it seems not a problem. And my first question is, what does it run? And he said, run. And I said, yes, there's software on this defibrillator, what does this device run? Do you know anything about the software? And the electrophysiologist said, software? He'd never thought about the software on these devices. So he goes out and he says, no problem. I'm going to run out right now of my office because the representative for Medtronic is here in the office right now. Tom is a great guy. He knows everything about these devices. Don't worry, I'm going to get him. He gets him. He brings Tom in. And Tom says, software? <laughs> he also had never thought about it. He said, this isn't a problem. If you call this hotline, they will tell you everything you need to know, and, it, you know, and you'll feel like these devices are perfectly safe, and this, you know, our devices are for you. And so uh, I called, dutifully called the hotline and did a phone tree runaround. Um, I did the same thing with the two other major defibrillator manufacturers at the time and, uh, and left messages on voicemails and ultimately didn't get anywhere. I offered to sign an NDA in order to review the source code. Um, you know, I'm a lawyer, but I was an engineer by training, and the very idea that I would have software in my own body that I couldn't look at or review was terrifying to me. And it was a real wake-up call because everybody in this, like every step in this process of, of finding out I had a heart condition, finding out I needed this therapy and I needed this device, to like doing the research on what I needed to do to find out more about it was basically predicated on the fact that no one in the service part of this industry had even thought about the software or that there was software at all on this device. And so uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Bill Gates as a cyborg, um, which is <laughs> uh, from, uh, as Borg from Star Trek, as a Borg. Um, so I had to decide what to do. I started putting it off, but I decided ultimately that I needed to get the device because it was such an unacceptably high um, chance of suddenly dying that every time I wouldn't call my mother back for a day or a friend um, you know, for two days, they would be so upset and call me crying and say, what are you, you know, I thought you would be, you were dead on the floor of your apartment. Like, and, I, and I realized that, um, you know, that I just needed to move forward. But luckily, I was already a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center um, and already thought that open source software was cool. And I was able to make this a part of my, my work there. And so I started researching software safety and, uh, and medical devices. And what I found out was really disturbing um, for starters, the, the, the medical device space, there are failures, um, and, uh, and worse still, these devices in particular have been shown to be vulnerable to attack. Um, academics were able to show that they were able to remotely take control of these devices using only over-the-counter equipment, and they were able to deliver unwanted shocks. They were able to get personal information off the devices, like social security numbers and doctor's names, and, um, and basically, 
most of these devices are broadcasting wirelessly all of the time, and medical device manufacturers are working on putting encryption in them, but currently there is no encryption in the devices that most people have. So um, I managed to get an old device myself, so if you're trying to hack into my device, you'll have to wait <laughs> until I get a new one. But, uh, but so mine is, uh, uses magnetic coupling for updates. But the idea is that they're broadcasting constantly, and there's information to be taken off of them. And researchers were able to show that they could take control of them and, and not only deliver unwanted shocks, but also put the device into testing mode. And testing mode basically runs down the battery, which means this device then becomes completely useless and you need surgery to get it replaced. Um, so uh, once you realize how fundamentally terrifying this is and, um, you know, and, and that we are, are putting our, our lives, that, you know, there's literally, this software is literally in something that is screwed into my heart. And it's a very short walk from there to cars, which have also been shown to be vulnerable to attack. And so I love this picture from one of the studies that was published, um, because as you can see, this car thinks it's going 140 miles per hour, but it's in park. Um, so uh, a premium class car has about 100 million lines of code in it. Um, the software engineering estimate uh, the Software Engineering Institute estimates that for every 100 lines of code, one bug is introduced, which means that for 100 million lines of code, that's one million defects that have to be caught and fixed during, um, yep, it's pretty scary. Um, there was a study shown on medical devices that showed that for uh, the medical devices that had been recalled due to uh, software problems, that 98% of the problems could have been detest detected with all Paris testing, which is testing for multiple conditions. Um, and there are many conditions that companies might not think of to test for. So for example, um, I am much younger than people tend to be when they get pacemaker defibrillators. I have had two children. And uh, pregnancy is not something that the defibrillator manufacturers are necessarily that focused on. So I've gotten, I got uh, two unwanted shocks during pregnancy and wound up taking medication to slow my heart rate down, not because that was necessarily dangerous for me, but to prevent me getting shocked again. So it's a very interesting, the, and, and, I, and believe me, Medtronic does not want pregnant women getting shocked. <laughs> that is the last thing that they want. But each use case might not be what the companies are focusing on. And now we live in an internet of things where everything is connected to everything else and we're only as safe as our weakest link. So for cars, for example, hackers didn't, you know, these academics didn't show vulnerabilities by going straight to the brake system. You go through the entertainment system, the wheel maintenance system, which is broadcasting to the dealers. Um, I'm gonna try to be really quick because I really wanna get your questions more than I want to, uh, to deliver this talk to you. But, uh, <laughs> but there's this interesting security phenomenon called the honeymoon effect. And when I first started talking about this, I felt a little bit like I was somewhat intellectually dishonest because I was conflating security issues with free and open source software issues. And I thought that there was no, like that the overlap between them wasn't as obvious or, or as direct. And now that more studies have come forward and we've learned more about the way these interact, in fact, it turns out that these two things are extremely squarely related. The honeymoon effect is a security effect, not about drinks on the beach, but about vulnerabilities in software over time. So the number of bugs in a piece of software generally declines over time. Um, as you would think, as software matures, bugs get fixed. But uh, if you look at vulnerabilities, um, there's a flat period where there are zero vulnerabilities um, for social and technical reasons. Um, the studies don't necessarily posit why that might be the case. But the point is that in effect, they looked at free and open, free and open source software, but they also looked at proprietary software systems. And so it turns out that there's a period of time where there are no vulnerabilities, and then once there are vulnerabilities found, then that um, increases almost exponentially. Um, and uh, what that tells me is that it's not today that we necessarily have to worry about the things that we're using, about the products we buy, about the things that our companies are making. It's down the road. It's when these companies don't have relationships with their vendors anymore, when their vendors have gone out of business. Um, under free and open source software, and raise your hand if you have you know anything about free and open source software, which is like almost, okay, it's everybody, hooray. Uh, so, so there's this thing called copy left, which is uh, basically requires that if you, if, you, if you use free and open source software, if you use um, software and you make modifications to it and you distribute those changes, it has to be under the same license. That's a copy left license. So uh, detractors call it viral, but it's like a snowballing effect of, of, of freedom. And it's the software is forever free. With free software, you have a right 
to get the complete and corresponding source code from the person who distributed it to you. And the companies that make these changes to to copy left its software and distribute their products have to give you the software they did along with the scripts to control installation. Which means that if you are, you know, if you're buying something from a company or if you get a device from them, or if, you, if there's free and open source software, you have a right to ask to see it. And even if you have no desire to see it, even if you don't care about software and you have no ability to under, if you, if you haven't taken the time to understand software, you, you can, keep a copy of that and wait until if you have a problem, then you can hire somebody to help you. You know, if I rely only on Medtronic for my software, then I have to wait for Medtronic to first admit there's a problem and secondly go to fix it. Um, so all of this turned what I thought was a cool thing of open source software into something I was super passionate about. And I started working on the nonprofit side. And Software Freedom Conservancy is an umbrella organization. We have um, about 40 free and open source software projects. Uh, m some of which all of you are using in some capacity or another um, underneath your products. Um, and uh, about <laughs> 3 million people have pacemakers, and about 600,000 have them implanted every year. Um, if we're all lucky, we will all be cyborgs. And this issue about the safety of our software and how our software interacts with each other is going to become ever more important. And so that is the canned portion of this talk. Um, and I really, really want to hear your questions. You could ask me anything, like, now that I'm a cyborg lawyer, can I have sh sparks throw out of my fingers? You know, shh. Yeah. So I might have missed the, this um, part of the, the talk, but what was the response that you got from Medtronic when you asked for, or what was that the interaction like, or relationship like? How were they receptive? Or? So I, I breezed through a lot of the points of this talk to try to get to this part. But uh, so it was interesting. It was really mixed, because I think that uh, individuals understood, especially any engineers that I got a hold of, understood that this issue was so fundamental and that if they were getting a device in their body, they would want to be able to review the technology that was implanted there. So I got a lot of individual sympathy, um, but a lot of inability to act. Um, and I effectively just got a runaround. I'd say I've had a lot more productive conversations recently as the medical device manufacturers are wising up to these issues. The FDA has published some, um, some guidance, which is woefully for, falls short on software transparency issues, but talks about encryption and about software um, just general software safety issues. And so I think that the medical device manufacturers are starting to wise up to that. Also, while there are more security studies and security information that point to free and open source software being safer over time, I think that the device manufacturers are beginning to start to understand that they can make a case for reduced liability through transparency, which is, I think, new. You know, I've been sort of advocates for software freedom have been saying that software can only be safe if it can be reviewed, if it can be patched by others. Um, free and open source software isn't necessarily safer, but it, it's the only way we're going to have safety in the long run. And I think they're just starting to wake up to that fact, but the lawyers at these companies are understandably extremely risk averse. What type of like audit system do you imagine for um, medical devices specifically? Because so much of open source development happens on like developer tools where people who could audit are also the ones using it. But here where the product is something that it would be most likely people who are not familiar at all with software. Yeah, really great question. I mean, a, the funny thing is that more and more people are getting these devices as the technology becomes cheaper, as diagnostic tools become cheaper. I have a, I have a condition that most people would never know that they had. Um, they would find out either you know, in 20 years when they started developing in a regular heartbeat, or they would find out by suddenly dying or becoming close to death. Um, and so more and more people are finding, and it's, they estimate now it's only like one in 500 people have it. So it's, it's somewhat more common. And as people, and you know, if you hear of kids that are like, you know, running to second base and die, or are young people who die in marathons, they often have this heart condition and didn't know about it. And so they're introducing routine screening at schools um, and thing like, things like that. And so we're finding out more and more about heart conditions that previously would have gone undiagnosed and medical conditions generally. And at the same time, younger and younger people are, are getting them who are tech savvy. And on the flip side, as we, as, as we as a society have tech savvy people becoming older and older, a lot of older people now are extremely tech savvy. And so the people who, the people who are re receiving these devices or are the patients for these devices are, are becoming much more um, 
able to conduct review and take a, a, a real interest. At the same time, there are university um, uh, you know, classes and other kinds of initiatives and labs that are designed to test safety. So there, I think there are a number of different ways that we could go in terms of, in terms of institutionalizing it. I think that if there were like a public comment period on software prior to its use in, um, in a product, I think that could be very helpful. Um, you know, I, I, I think that it's, uh, that these, these, these issues are, are complex. And so, you know, I think uh, things like, um, it's a little bit easier in some ways in, in other areas like voting machines. So Brazil, for example, did this thing where they conducted a, um, a contest and they invited teams of hackers to come and to show vulnerabilities in, their, um, in the voting machines and then they were able to uh, win cash prizes. And two teams found vulnerability. Well, one team found a sort of vulnerability. The other team found a vulnerability. They both won cash prizes. And if we publish the software that we rely on, with incentives for people to come and find, you know, I think a lot of airline people are, are doing this all over now. Airlines are, uh, are are having programs where people can earn miles by uh, reviewing their software and finding vulnerabilities. And so I think that more and more of this, uh, we have a lot of different models, and we should start trying them out. Oh, Audrey, I'll let you pick. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question actually has to do with the idea of vulner vulnerabilities and the slide that you had about the honeymoon effect. So are vulnerabilities errors, like what you showed in the lines of code with, um, for cars, or are they, um, are vulnerabilities places in the code or et cetera that aren't wrong, that don't have errors in them, but are available to be exploited in some way? Do you see what I mean? So does does the, con does the idea of vulnerability uh, include both errors and just things that aren't wrong but are able to be exploited by people who know I believe how it's to the latter. I'd have okay. to review this study again, but, um, but I believe that it's the latter because if, if, the, if the software can be exploited, that's the, that's the issue of relevance, not whether it's a mistake. Mm -hmm. right. I can send you the study if you take my card after. It, it was sort of just more when, because I know this term vulnerabilities has mm -hmm. kind of, is used a lot. And so even with the example that used with the voting machines, was it that the hackers found errors in the code or did they just find ways to exploit code that maybe just, do you see what I mean, that had areas of weakness in, Generally, some, in some way? Generally, we're talking about areas that can be exploited because if things are, are wrong, then that's a, that's, a, that's a defect. It's a bug in the code, but it's Got not it. necessarily a vulnerability. vulnerability. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. I was a lawyer before I was an entrepreneur. <laughs> Excuse me. And it came to what I'm working on now by, by launching an open source incubator. So, um, oh. but my question, I... I apologize if it's kind of off, maybe topic a little bit, but I think it's more about what kind of projects the Conservancy is supporting. And the area of interest that I have is, is w uh, around whether anyone is really working on like coming up with a, um, a credit scoring algorithm that they make open source almost as a, um, a way of assaulting <laughs> a market which is very heavily oriented towards you know, proprietary predictive analytics in credit scoring and profiling. Does that, make, does that question make any sense? Can you sense? talk a little bit more about the credits, like what, what you mean about that? So the, um, there's more of this in consumer credit than small business credit. In my area, small business right. credit. But, but it has to do with what you'll typically see as a company, a startup announcing that they are using non-traditional data to do credit scoring and they bill it as a way for greater financial inclusion. And there's some alarm bells that should be going off when you hear something like that. So my question was whether you've seen any open source projects that are saying, okay, we're going to show that we're going to open source our system, including the scoring algorithm, and make that available for anyone to use as a way of bringing transparency. There are a couple of software projects that are underway now that are sort of in this general area. And unfortunately, I can't remember what they're called. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I think the move towards having sort of um, business uh, small, like sort of uh, fractions of industry come together and around a code base and releasing it as a way to get a leg up in the industry has sort of taken off a little bit more. Um, uh, for example, the uh, W3C is working on open payments uh, and there's the Spec Ops project, which is in Conservancy. None of the Conservancy projects are working on this issue, but there are, um, there, there's a number of things around if you, 
I can think of them and email them to you if you give me a comment after. Um, could you say a little bit, uh, um, are the medical device people also constrained by the DMCA um, restrictions on research into DRM and things like that? Or I'm so there's incentive. I'm also free software or open source fan, great. But there are other incentives apart from liability encoded in law that might prevent them from open sourcing. So I'm trying to understand what the kind it's of very legal landscape is. Mm -hmm. So the DMCA would apply if there were technological measures in place that you would have to circumvent in order to do your research, ah, okay. which it's so, it's so wrongheaded, right? Like we have proprietary closed software, but we have no security on many of these devices. It's like the worst of both worlds. Uh, so right now, if I wanted to interface, like intercept my own device, it, uh, I wouldn't be circumventing any technological protection measures because I don't think there are any. Um, but I'm advocating for technological, for, for there to be real security, real encryption on these devices. And so, uh, you know, it, it, this is happening now, in which case it will become, we will run afoul of the DMCA in order to um, do conduct research with these medical devices to the extent you'll have to circumvent them. Um, and so I was part of a, a group of uh, medical researchers who applied for an exemption to the uh, DMCA. Uh -huh. um, just this past triennial review, and we received the exemption with a 12-month waiting period. So, sorry, 12-month, yes, 12-month, one-year waiting period. Um, and so uh, we also, Conservancy applied also for an exemption for smart TVs. Um, now, you know, I, there are other limits on the exemption, so, th but what's interesting is that we have all of these overlapping regimes, and the very idea that copyright would prevent you from conducting research on medical device safety is crazy. Like we shouldn't have the, you know, we, we, I, the idea that we were asking the cop, you know, Library of Congress, the Copyright Office, to grant an exception for something we should be talking to the FDA about was really insane. Um, but uh, we did get the exemption. So now going forward, you will have an exemption. Then again, the DMCA exemption process is rolling. So we'll have to yeah, reapply yeah. for it again. So why the year, why the 12 month sort of embargo? Basically to allow manufacturers and governmental agencies to adjust to the fact that researchers will be able to do this work. Are there that other, was the stated reason. Are there other large classes of devices in the world of the Internet of Things right now that, that are squarely within the DMCA's anti-circumvention measures? So you, anything you that... Smart TVs, but are there other more critical infrastructure things that have this... Oh, yeah. Area? I mean, so like, there are exemptions for smartphones, um, which sound like they're not super critical, but when your smartphone is talking to... So uh, there are people working on things where, for example, you track your, um, uh, if you're diabetic, you can track your blood sugar levels and take information off your insulin pump and at the same time track it with your exercise regime and your diet. Very sensible things sound like great applications, but suddenly your smartphone is interfacing with your insulin pump. Um, and so as your smartphone, uh, you know, is in charge of your home temper you know your your security system or your um, your HVAC right and many people have their phones attached to their you know connecting with their refrigerator or their light bulbs right and uh, and I have a friend who showed that the uh, the one brand I won't say which brand one brand of light bulbs were totally vulnerable to attack and so it's like you know every what is critical now like which is the critical software is very hard to identify so um, cars was another s section of, uh, of uh, devices or um, products that were uh, applied for exemptions. There's, um, uh, this is sort of something we're going to see more and more of. As, as everything talks to everything else, we're going to need the ability to research and to, and to tweak. And we shouldn't be beholden to particular manufacturers for modifying this stuff. This, this is, this is, these are our lives. This is our society. This is how we're communicating with each other. This is how we are building our entire society. Our, our financial markets, our, our, our personal safety, everything is connected. And so um, I think we're going to see, start to see this more in terms of what we're asking, we as a society are asking for exemptions from the DMCA. So do you think that the solution is more or less to keep the DMCA intact, but create a special carve out in it or like a, like a standing exemption from the Librarian of Congress, or do we just like 
junk the whole thing and I think the DMCA is deeply problematic. Um, I think the Copyright Act <laughs> is deeply problematic. <laughs> so we could talk about that. Like I think the idea that we have copyrights of such long duration, this is why we have copy left. We have copy left because of copyright. Copy left is a hack on copyright. Copy left is strong because we keep co because the copyright maximalist keeps extending copyright. I mean, I think that software, the idea that, that you've got uh, a century of protection over software copyrights is insane. What is going to be relevant of this software in 70, 90, 100 years? It's crazy. Thank you. Have you done any work at the Conservancy on kind of like critical infrastructure? So like our traffic cameras and our traffic lights and all of these things that researchers have proven are open to vulnerabilities but are often closed source? Um, so some of the stuff we do for critical infrastructure, so for example, the Git project, uh, Git, which is what GitHub is based on, um, uh, Git is a member of the Software Freedom Conservancy. And so uh, Samba, which is, uh, you know, so th there are a lot of things that we have that are projects that are on the lower levels of the technology that are used. And then we also represent um, copyright holders, individual copyright holders in the Linux kernel which is basically in almost everything, who are frustrated that companies are not following the GPL, which is the license used for copyleft. And so uh, they've asked us to enforce their, um, their licenses for them, which means that we uh, wind up taking legal action and compelling companies, but we, we try to do it in a friendly and principled way. But, uh, but so that's one of the ways in which we're active. We don't have any um, court infrastructure um, projects at that higher level, but we would welcome them. Um, I think that we, par we participate in a lot of the discussions around the development of these um, kinds of technologies, um, but, uh, but we're a charitable organization, and so we need the public to really, we're a 501c3, we need the, org we need the public to, uh, to say that these issues matter in order to keep companies invested in, um, in software safety in this kind of overarching way and allow this community input. Um, otherwise, uh, the, to the extent that this stuff happens, it happens in trade associations that have a very strong interest in keeping the highest paying companies uh, happy, which uh, can work out great. Like there are times when trade associations are exactly the way that some of this stuff should be done, but I think that uh, the public should take a greater role in this and it should be done more in a charitable setting. Thanks for your talk. Um, I wonder, I mean, you're talking, I just, you just addressed um, how the conservancy might align or not align with different sort of stakeholders. I wonder if, um, you know, what your interests are might align with the cybersecurity community, just mm -hmm. in terms of, I mean, you mentioned sort of a, an attack on devices and that could, um, you know, result in, um, you know, lack of human security and um, it also could have like ramifications for maybe military and others, and so I wonder um, if you find any allies in that community, um, and particularly whether um, you know, they might even get that open software actually makes um, vulnerabilities less likely. Mm -hmm. I'd say more and more so. I've, you know, like I've, there's been a real change in the last five years um, where I would say that the connection between security and free and open source software has become a lot clearer. Um, and I also sort of felt passionately about free software because of my own situation and the, in, like, the frustration and indignance I felt at not being able to, and the, the, how insulted I felt that I couldn't see the software in my body. It seemed so direct, but I struggled to articulate why this was such a fundamental cause, why I thought we should be a charity, why, you know, I, I, I struggled with it a little bit to say, like, why this is of such top level importance, but now, we rely on software for pretty much everything. Every humanitarian cause, in order to accomplish what they're doing effectively, will be relying on software for their critical mission activities. And so software freedom is the infrastructure that supports all of these things. And so um, you know, I've, I've slowly become convinced that, in fact, software freedom is not this kind of esoteric issue that's a nice to have. It's, an, in fact, an absolute must have. And, and part of that has been converging with things like the cybersecurity community. And while there has been more information 
information available about um, you know and studying the impact of free and open source software versus proprietary systems. And so we're seeing a lot of allies in the cybersecurity system. And one of the really interesting things that has happened recently is that within the free software world, I don't know if you've ever heard any of this, but people have been fighting about free software versus open source software, like software freedom, open source. And there's been a real convergence recently. And what's fascinating is that people who were die-hard permissive licensing people, so people who believed that their software shouldn't be licensed under copyleft, but should instead be licensed under a license that says you can do whatever you want with this license, with this software. You can do whatever you want, you can even make it into proprietary products if you would like to. Um, and some people believe that was a more free license to use because it's, it actually allows more things. But um, whereas the copyleft people say it's less free because it's not forever free. People who were permissive licensing advocates especially in like the, the uh, wireless space and connectivity spaces, have become copyleft advocates in the last few years because they see the software that they developed get used in proprietary products that they can't evaluate for safety or that they find are insecure and that they can't patch them. And so over time, the people who are technologically able and who are invested in these things are, are slowly coming over to copyleft for security reasons, and that's percolating through the cybersecurity community as well. I, I hope it continues because I think it's clear to me that that's the, the only way forward. Anybody have any other questions? Sorry to ask so many questions. Um, how are you operating differently like at the Conservancy than you were at the Software Freedom Law Center on this uh, issue? Well, so the Software Freedom Law Center is a legal services organization. It's providing legal services to some of its clients. Um, and uh, with Conservancy, we are, our, we are our projects. So our projects are a part of us, and we represent them. Um, so it's a completely different organization. Um, uh, there are a lot of a, a lot of differences between the two organizations. Um, you know, I think with Conservancy, projects apply to be a part of us. It's a sort of a different uh, process. And once they do, we have a general counsel. So I'm a lawyer, but I mostly act in a non-legal capacity. Um, and then we have a lot of legal activities. But for so example, when we um, uh, when we conduct things like GPL enforcement. Uh, we uh, we hire litigators or have pro bono counsel represent us. So, could you talk about the criteria that you would use to select a project under the conservancy, or what kind of uh, uh, yeah or criteria you use to accept a project or not under your umbrella? Yeah, we have an evaluations committee, which is a group of extremely impressive people. Um, they're, uh, they're people who have been invested in free and open source software as individuals for a very long time. And the committee looks for things like, so uh, it's great because the committee is composed of people who have totally diverse skill sets and interests. So we've got like people who are serious developers who dig into the code base and just take a look and see. Mostly it's focused on like, um, licensing to make sure that it's truly free and open source software licensed. Um, we look at the documentation. We look at the community. We make sure that it's a true community, that it's not the product of a company or even like two companies, that in fact it's a, a legitimate free and open source software community that befitting of a of a 501c3. So the IRS um, took a lot of interest in free and open source software. So I don't know if you uh, heard about the um, special scrutiny that the IRS was giving to the to Tea Party organizations. It was like this big scandal and a lot of changeover at the IRS because of it. And so they were apparently at the same time, they put together a list of key trouble words. And on the list of like keywords that they needed to watch out for were, uh, were not just Tea Party, but journalism and also open source software. And I thought I was being such a bridge builder in like 2008 because I was like lobbying in these like forming organizations and putting in the applications with the free with the IRS where I always used free and open source software and I was like I'm being so bridge building in my community it doesn't have to be just free software like the diet you know like the diehard ideological people want it to be it can be free and open source software 
And then everyone will know what we're talking about. It was a huge mistake because including open source software basically got all the applications flagged um, that had previously been going through no problem. And there was a big freeze from 2008 until just two years ago, basically. And so uh, we've kind of worked through this issue. But when that was flagged, we realized that we needed to take extra care with the way that Conservancy was organized and reevaluate all of our procedures against all of the IRS regulations, which don't fit neatly to software, don't fit neatly to free and open source software as a cause. And so it was kind of an interesting and fun process. And what we've emerged with on the other side is sort of a, a committee that is deeply aware of um, what we're doing and why we want to make sure we're using our resources in the public interest to make sure there's no private inurement and, and things like that. So, um, so sometimes we have projects apply that aren't ready to come into us yet. Um, and uh, we, we're trying to find ways to help like less mature projects or projects that don't. But often we recommend that they go to a trade association if that's where they're better, better housed. Um, can I ask another question about sort of liability? Um, so you succeed and medical device manufacturers primarily use open source code for their devices. Um, is the knock-on effect that now it's actually harder to, to determine liability if the device fails because responsibility for the code has been distributed institutionally? And that actually it's better if they could have kept it locked up because you would know who to sue? And, um, or, at, or in the world of the Internet of Things inside our bodies, have we given up on, on, on liability for, so, for failures? <laughs> <laughs> is that a, also, so, is that a terrible question? And you can. It. It's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I think liability is what drives so much of the work in this field. I mean, the, the, the thing is that I want the software in my device to be free and open for review, but I want to be able to control who modifies the actual software in my body. So, for example, if let's use, let's pick on Medtronic. I happen to be a, a fan. They, um, as the medical device companies go, uh, my. Uh, doctors recommend them because they are more responsive when there's a problem and they're happy with the support that they get. So I don't want to pick on them too much, but let's pick on Medtronic. So <laughs> if Medtronic were to, hooray, uh, release the code for their devices and go the extra step even of opening up the software to community development, which would be kind of gold star, right? So if they were to do that, I would not expect Medtronic to necessarily take on the community version like the, the patches that are submitted by anyone in the community without deep, deep review, right? And so they've got a staff that handles their software development. They would rejigger it to review what was happening um, externally, and they would put in their products only software patches and software versions that they were extremely comfortable with. And then they would, you know, and, th and then what could happen is consulting companies could spring up who could conceivably take that software that they publish and potentially make a new version. So for example, um, I've got, I don't know where it is, but I've got my phone. It's an old Google G1, which makes me cool and retro. But, <laughs> but it came with a, a, a Google version of Android on it. And I've replaced the software with Replicant, where I feel, which is a free build, and I feel a little bit more comfortable uh, having control of my software. So if they release the code, then you could have a whole, account, like a whole little community of uh, of consultants that sprang up that also were extremely savvy and, um, and medical professionals where people could hire if they have particular problems, like, for example, if I were, for example, pregnant and worried about getting shocked, I could, have, I could hire those. If I had enough money, I could hire them to evaluate my software. Um, or they could create new products for niche markets. So, for example, um, a lot of parents of diabetic kids have gotten very involved with the software on insulin pumps because if you can control the insulin delivery very precisely, you're much less likely to have damage over time. And it's like a huge investment in their kids' longevity and they are familiar with their kids' exercise and their kids' diet and this insulin, you know, the sugar spikes that the insulin spikes that they have. Um, and so they can, they can develop that more precisely. And so I don't, I'm not advocating for anyone to be able to make a change to Medtronic software um, and have that be accepted by Medtronic if, or the, for them to be forced to do that. What I'm advocating for is for Medtronic to release their code so it can be audited safely and also so that others can pick it up. So if there's a problem, if there's catastrophic failure at Medtronic right now, not only can we not patch it, which means that my device becomes not just a, a, a 
useless, but also a liability. Not only can I not patch it, but I, I can't, I don't, there's not even a copy of it. There's no public repository. The FDA doesn't review the software on these devices generally, so they don't even have a copy. So if something happens at Medtronic and there's complete failure, and I'm sure that Medtronic has backups and things like that, but I'm, am I sure, right? We don't even have a copy. So it's a bad situation right now. Did you have a question? this. Um, the way that you just framed that, I could see there being some problems in terms of barriers to access, both technical and financially, when people actually want to make modifications to the software. So are there groups that are trying to address this to help people who don't have um, you know, those capabilities? Try and even it out a little bit. This is where free and open source software is essential, right? Because so if you're using critical software for you and you don't speak English, then you may not be aware if there's a problem with your software, or you may not be able to reach your communities. And so a lot of, um, with free and open source software, individual communities can spring up that can translate it. So for example, there's a software project um, within Conservancy where uh, Sugar Labs, where they, which is software for kids. Have you ever heard of One Laptop Per Child? It was the software for One Laptop Per Child, um, where it was deployed in a, a town that spoke a dialect that nobody else spoke in the world. And they were able to create a dictionary of their own language that they were able to use. Um, you know, like Microsoft would never give that permission for Office. But with LibreOffice, you can, or with uh, Abbey Word, you can create a dictionary of your own language. You can basically customize it to for whatever you need. And so with free and open source software, you get a lot more access. And you get a lot of more, because uh, as I said, you know, for example, um, pregnant women don't make up a huge percentage of the recipients of Medtronic defibrillators. Uh, there are surely tons of other small classes of people that I don't even know about or haven't even thought about for most products on the market who can come together and take software that's released as free and open and create a customized version that is not only more useful for their needs, but is also safer for their particular situations. With proprietary software, we have vendor lock-in. We, we, are, we are tied to a particular company for whatever product it is. And you know, if that company stops supporting their product, then we have to throw them out and get new ones. Whereas with free and open source software, you can use old equipment and put new, you know, new software on them, and you've, you're, you're in business. You can do something with it. So it's, I, I'd say it's become not only a, a, a safety issue, but it's also kind of an environmental one because with uh, software freedom, we can take old equipment and reuse it in effective ways. Hey, I have a question about um, crossovers between this medical device and the software being compared to like a pharmaceutical drug and the ingredients and warnings and also copyright. Like I don't... I didn't look this up before asking this question, but it seems that drugs can't have like market proprietary, they have to be released to generic drug company like for affordability. So have you researched or has that path been helpful at all in your advocacy so of comparing a device software to ingredients of a drug? Or? It's a really good question. So there are all of these overlapping regimes of law that apply to software. Um, so in the, the, um, the drug market, it's patents that pretty much control um, the, uh, you know, that basically are, regulate the area in terms of giving companies an advantage um, for being the first, uh, the first out or developing their drugs. But patents are only 20 years, whereas copyright is so, so much longer. And of course, in software, you've got not only do, does copyright apply, but also patents. And not just at which nobody can really understand that well, really what software patents apply, you know, it's, it's a total mess. And, um, and on top of that, we also have trademarks apply and trade secrets apply to software. So we've got all these overlapping, um, you know, uh, areas of law, none of which were originally designed for software. Um, and so uh, we often do look to other areas to make comparisons as to, um, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And I think that one of the things that you can see from the drug space, which is very useful, is how it really helps when the generic drug comes in. So you've got the 20-year period, and then the generic comes in, and uh, it, there's a huge, much more access to people, and price comes down. Um, and in the copyright world, the equivalent of that would be the public domain. But 
it's so long for that to happen that 20 and and I would say that generally dr pharmaceutical drugs have a much you know have more longevity in terms of their usefulness than software generally I mean there's some stuff so some software we are still using that is from the 70s and uh, and 80s for sure some legacy code sticks around a really long time but sort of when you think about like useful new software you would think that it would necessarily like what are we going to be using in 20 years it's going to be totally different um, so I think that sort of taking from the drug space the fact that uh, that patents expire after a reasonable period of time and bringing that to software I think that would help a lot so it's a very good question This is a follow-up to um, that point about uh, the issue of proprietary and parts and such. So one of the broader issues I found is to quite many, I'd say probably the majority of people out there, it's probably a very select group in this room, but just those every other conversation I had, so mentioning open source or free and open source, not only having to clarify, well, free and free speech, but also explain how it's not this false choice between commercially viable and free and open source. It's that perception issue. So how are you going about combating that uh, perception issue of uh, free and open source? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, and it's, this is, this is the, 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 the forever, this is why, okay, this is where I need all of your help. Because the people who are like me, who have been very active in free and open source software and software freedom generally, we are geeky people who are so into our own niche that when it comes to messaging and explaining why these issues are important, we fall short. We are good at explaining to geeks. We are not so good explaining to people at large why these issues matter. The question also started talking about the, um, uh, how commercial interests in free and open source software are not um, working at cross purposes. Um, mo almost, I think I would say, Practically all of the major businesses, if not all of them, rely on free and open source software now to get. Yeah, so it's the server space, pretty much all, all of the critical infrastructure is free and open. But uh, as open stuff gets pushed further and further down the stack, we have more free and open source software than ever before, but less freedom. Like, we're getting products that we can't review, we can't modify, we can't do anything with it. I think every, pretty much everybody here has a Mac. Apple, like, uh, you know, will lock down all of your products as much as possible, and it's becoming harder and harder to get laptops to put GNU Linux on. Um, you know, we, we need to think about this messaging in ways that everyone could understand, but the people who are trying to talk about it are not as equipped to frame the issue in ways that people will care about. And I find that I can get people to care by talking about my heart condition, which I hate doing because I don't want to tell people that I have a medical condition. It's awful. Um, I don't, like, every single time I talk about it, it makes me cringe inside. But I talk about it because it puts things in terms that people can understand and care about. And I feel like we need ways to, to think about it. With, uh, with companies in particular, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt about um, the enforcement around copyleft licenses, which are what we really need in order to keep our software free and reviewable over time. Copyleft requires not only the software to be released, but also the scripts that you need to do something with it. If you have a problem and you can't look at the source code of your device and you can't get the scripts to control compilation and to do something about a problem, then you may as well not have the source code to begin with. So copyleft is the way that we can handle it, but there's so much FUD about free and open source software and the risk around copyleft, but the truth is there's so much less in terms of lawsuits around free and open source around copyleft than there is in proprietary software. And for those of us who are involved in enforcement, uh, conservancy, uh, we published this, uh, uh, less than a year ago, we published principles around enforcement so that we uh, we bring assurance, like surety, to the fact that we are not enforcing for monetary gain primarily. We are, we will allow confidentiality. We're basically these principles for community-led enforcement, so that we bring more safety to the space. And what I think we need to do is we need companies to sort of take a step forward and say, we rely on free and open source software. Uh, we understand that it's safer and likely to be like all software is litigious. There's just no way around it. There are going to be lawsuits. But with free and open source software, it's it's limited. And so everybody here, please think about it and online, please think about this and give me your ideas because I need them desperately. 
So I think this is not a question, it's a note of encouragement. So one thing that was buried in what you said, which I think is really profound, is the importance of stories and how, how when we have closed software or closed systems, the, the real, very real damage that can do. So I think people connect with that. But I would also submit it's, it's about much more than messaging. Because I think this conundrum of, is it conver commercially viable if it's open source or not, that, that's a big topic and it's one that I've been in groups that have been working on off and on for a long time. And, and to the extent you could take that on as a project, uh, or anyone can take that on as a project and really try to get to the, the bottom of that, I think is incredibly useful. Great. Yeah, yeah, it's something that we're all, uh, pretty, most of us, so, uh, so there was a time when I said when the free software and the open source software people fought a lot, well, we're now post that and, you know, conservancy, software freedom conservancy um, works with the, you know, Free Software Foundation. I'm also pro bono counsel to the Free Software Foundation. And we also have close ties with the Open Source Initiative now. And we're all focused on coming together and trying to solve these big problems because with a divided community, we're simply not going to get there. Um, can I circle back and put a little bit of pressure on the commerce piece? Um, so it seems to me that the medical context is different than the other areas where good cases have been made, like servers and that kind of thing. Um, because you have really different insurance regimes, depending on where you, where you are, um, that bring in different kinds of incentives that are, co I guess, commercial or financial. So, so it's not simply that you know, the company has a product that they've taken to market that incorporates some open source libraries, it's that there are also insurers and doctors and these other institutions involved. Um, and so I guess my question is sort of like, but wait, wait, it's complicated. Um, how are you thinking about the insurance industry in terms of medical devices specifically? It's ex first of all, it's extremely complicated. All these issues are complicated and that's what makes it so hard is that you know, I, I can't stand in, I, I can't with academic, with any kind of intellectual integrity, stand up here and say that free and open source software is better. That is simply a false statement, right? There's so much free and open source software that is terrible. But when our software is free and open, over time it will be better, it will be safer. And so it's not a simple check mark. It's not a simple, if we release our code, it will be safer, it will be better. It's that if we want, safer and better software, we must use free and open source software. So better and safer software is a subset of free and open source software. And so it's a, it's, it's, when you say it's complicated, that is like exactly hits the nail on the head because every part of this thing is complicated. Every piece of it is complicated. And when you look at the medical devices space, it adds all these extra layers of complexity. And when I started out on this issue, I first published a paper analyzing all of my research and I posted a link onto the defibrillator forums. There are a couple of forums. They're amusingly named things like the Zap Forum. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, I, paced, I said, hey, you, should, you guys should take a look at this as people who have defibrillators about this, these problems in the software. And I got this lashback. Like, you don't know what it's like to live with a, you know, with a device that you rely on. You're just trying to scare us. I trust my doctor, my doctor says this device is safe. And that's when I realized I had to talk about my own medical history because I was actually, I do know what it's like to rely on one of these devices, I have one. Um, and so I stopped advocating as much towards patients and started advocating to doctors. And not necessarily, just for doctors to ask the question, like what is the software, you know, is the software transparent, can it be reviewed, can it be modified if there's a problem, what if there's catastrophic failure at your company, you know, is there a, a public repository somewhere? Is there a team of professionals that are set in order to, you know, basically asking those questions that you were asking about what would we have in place for a good, uh, you know, a good mechanism for, for auditable software. Um, and, and, and just asking the questions would have companies move over to um, evaluating free and open source software. Um, and I would say that the case for liability has to be built and those mechanisms have to be built and it's not something that can be done overnight. And I think the insurance companies will come along once the case has been made that the only truly safe way to build software over time is with free and open source software because the insurance companies should realize that it will be cheaper for them over time if when there's a failure at a company that multiple actors can come and patch devices and make it safe. Because otherwise, if you have a major software vulnerability, it's going to be an insur insurance nightmare. And they're gonna have to pay out a lot more. 
Thank you so much, Karen. That was awesome. And I hope we can continue having a relationship uh, because I feel like you articulate some very important concerns that we should have on our radar. And hopefully we can help you as we're having our conversation move forward, move you forward with us. So thank you. Thanks, Audrey.